The following interview was conducted with Larry Priel, the Executive Director Emeritus of the Purdue Alumni Association for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, October 15, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Um, yes, ma'am. But first, uh, I must tell you how honored I am to, to be included in, the, in, the, in this project. Uh, when I saw the list of uh, other folks you've interviewed, I'm, uh, uh, as a Purdue undergraduate, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored. Uh, I'm f 67 years old now. Uh, born and raised in inner city Chicago, not in the suburbs, but inner city. Uh, three brothers, no sisters. Uh, kind of, it, now if you reflect back on it, it was a very uh, mixed neighborhood, a, a rough, what you'd expect in inner city Chicago. Uh, Croatian, uh, Croatian and Italian neighborhood. And uh, our family considers ourselves French, so we were... Uh, in a, in a very, uh, what would be called a depressed neighborhood today. Uh, mom and dad uh, came from the state of Maine. My dad was a lumberjack who somehow ended up in Chicago. Uh, was a, a playground instructor for the Board of Education in Chicago. Uh, my three brothers, uh, I'm the third of four. All three of them were high school or grade school teachers, coaches. Uh, two stayed in Chicago after they got their degrees and worked in the Chicago system. One brother moved to Duluth Superior. Uh, I was fortunate to come to Purdue uh, January 1959. In Chicago, you can start grade school and high school at the mid-semester, depending on your birthday, because there's so many kids in the school system. So I graduated from high school January of 59, started Purdue, and at the orders of my mother, I graduated from Purdue in four years. So I graduated in January of 59, uh, of 63. Yeah. Let me back up. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what high school was like, where you went to high school, what activities and things you were involved in, uh, and then how you decided to come to Purdue. I attended Austin High School, uh, <coughs> an inner city high school. Um, attended Austin on a uh, permit. I, was n I didn't live in, in, the sh in the Austin High School district, uh, but I uh, had played some sports and was uh, fortunately recruited, even though that was illegal at the time to, to attend that school. I had to enroll in Greek at Austin to, to take the language Greek because it was the only high school in Chicago that that taught Greek so uh, because it was you weren't to be recruited to do any of those kinds of illegal nefarious things I uh, what was your sport in athletic which I, I was a football player okay. uh, and mm -hmm. in fact that's how I was able to attend Purdue I uh, uh, one of those uh, young men who I uh, was a high school all-american football player uh, and your team must have done pretty well. Though. Yes, ma'am. We were undefeated, won the state title, and no matter, it, it, I say this in reflection now, no matter what the team did, I got the credit for it. I was what a quarterback, position? and uh, uh, we went undefeated and uh, won all of the titles. And for again, uh, as I reflect on it, I, I, w I thought I was a fantastic player, but I really wasn't. But for whatever reason, I tended to get the credit. Uh, and so, you know, the most valuable player in the city and the uh, high school All-American awards and recruited at, at a number of schools and uh, chose Purdue. Uh, came to Purdue and I was one of the great unwashed, always on the sidelines, and uh, uh, my career, what, what it could, what it wasn't. Uh, was terminated, uh, was injured, uh, had a blood clot paralysis, uh, woke up one morning in the uh, Logansport State Mental Hospital. The doctors, it, uh, it was in a game, I think it was Notre Dame, and got banged in the head and the, the blood clot uh, put pressure on nerves and 
and they had this young man who was paralyzed. They didn't quite know what to do, I think, and that was me, and I ended up uh, at, at Logansport for a night or two. The blood clot dissolved on its own. I returned, had all my faculties and uh, except great fear <laughs> of being hit again and uh, that was a uh, again a very difficult thing as a young man to to deal with but it turned out uh, Catherine to be one of the best uh, if not the best thing to ever happen to me that brought me to Purdue uh, introduced me to some wonderful peers and, and great uh, university folks who uh, took, I say took care of me. My, my father died when I was a senior in high school. And by the way, my mom, he was 52 and my mom lived to be 97. So uh, we're not sure, my brothers and I, we're not sure which genes we had, <laughs> but luckily we're all, we're all still alive, uh, alive and well. Were there any other activities in high school, any clubs that you uh, uh, recall? After dropping out of Greek, <laughs> I guess. That I, must I took, have been a real challenge. Oh, uh, and it, it lasted, I think, by requirement. I had to stay in it one semester to keep my eligibility at the high school. Um, so I struggled through that. Uh, I, I was not a very uh, uh, rigorous student. The other activities I participated in were all sports, uh, wrestling and track and field. Uh, w with three brothers uh, living in the, uh, in the city, each of us had to work. So when it wasn't football season, uh, I was expected to have a part-time job, and I was, given, I was given dispensation during the football season. Uh, so I really did not hang out at high school. My Get a high busy school, schedule. yeah, my high school years were uh, the only memories were the the, the participation yeah, in football, and uh, we we were so far away from that high school uh, in the city that I had to take two buses and the and one L just to get to school, and we didn't uh, couldn't afford a, a car, so there was a lot of time spent. Uh, traveling to yeah transfer absolutely getting the transfer uh, getting to see the city and some <laughs> interesting ways uh, so that that was uh, my young years uh, who was the coach when you came to Purdue you came uh, in 59 right I came in 59 Jack Mullenkoff okay. uh, and any comments on of course we can't really interview him but a lot of people do you have anything you care to share uh, Jack uh Catherine, he had been the coach for some time. He had he been, was, right. and, and he, this was in the early 60s. Uh, he took the Purdue team to the Rose Bowl in the late 60s, 67, 68. Right. Uh, while we were there, uh, Jack was not a terribly articulate uh, coach to individual team numbers unless you were a starter on that in that first one or two units. Uh, these were the days where there were no NCAA restrictions on team size. So uh, Jack's philosophy, and he would often say, uh, you can't beat me if you're sitting on my bench. So he and uh, Ohio State and Iowa uh, those were the big teams at the time. They uh, tried to, or they would attempt to recruit as many athletes as they could and keep them on the team even though they weren't playing. But as Jack would say, if you're sitting on my bench, you're not playing for Minnesota Prio and you're not beating me. Now, okay. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I would never have been able to beat him anyways. Sure. But at the time, that was the theory. Uh, so there were over 110 young men on the team during those times. So just I think the, the pure size prevented Jack from spending a lot of time with individuals. So while I was a player, I did not know Coach Mollenkoff well at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the, was, the there, was there any financial help at that time? Or yes, ma'am. I, I had a full scholarship, room, board, tuition, books, fees supplies. Uh, I would never have been able to 
go to college uh, were it not that case. So um, two of my brothers, two of my other brothers, also had athletic scholarships. Uh, and our oldest brother was an artsy, fartsy kid who uh, sold paintings and worked his way through college sure. eventually. But we all had to, if we didn't have scholarships, we'd have been working through. Our, our parents expected us to, but sure, sure. There, there was no, no help. Um, and I, as I, again, as I reflect, I didn't realize it at the time what a great man he was. And same, same for Red Mackey. When I was injured, was Mac Mackey? Red Mackey was the athletic director. Okay. Mackey Arena. Oh yeah, I know. That, I, yeah. I was just trying to put in perspective what his role was at the time. At, you were at here. the time, uh -huh. at the time I was here, he was uh, the athletic director and had previously been an assistant football coach. Red was a. In, again, in, in retrospect, was a strong football man. And we had uh, uh, Hovde, who had, uh, was the president of the university at the time, and Fred Hovde had played football at Minnesota, uh, and was a rogue scholar, and Fred was very much a supporter of athletics. So those I've three men were from his really, book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, really tight. He used to go out and watch the practice. Oh, yes, ma'am. It was quite, quite common to see him to see Others him have there. the same thing, yeah. he'd be out there. Yeah, and, and a golfer. All right. uh, and again, I, I didn't realize this at the time, but sure. they were just dynamic. When I was injured, uh, they did it, not have to. Were you to, injured at a Notre Dame game? Uh, or was it a Purdue game? You were it playing, was a Purdue. So it, it was a game here? It was a game here, and I believe it, it was my, during my sophomore year, and we were playing uh, the, the, the at the time, freshmen could were not eligible to play varsity, so there were what they called freshman games, and it was Notre Dame. Even though I was a sophomore, since I was that half semester, they had me playing on the on the frosh off team. I think they called it frosh off. Yeah, freshman sophomore team. Uh, in, in following the injury, it was in during that game that I was injured. Uh, for the last time, I was regularly having concussions, so I was predisposed to, to getting knocked out quite quite often. In fact, uh, some of the guys used to have a pool at the start of each week. You know, everybody would kick in a buck and how long will Priya last this week? Yeah. Uh, but, but Red and, and Coach Molenkoff kept my scholarship. I mean, I never played a, a, a moment. Uh, I never scored a touchdown against IU. So I was just... Uh, one of the great unwashed, but those men, uh, and they didn't do it for many folks. Once you were injured, you know, you the door hit you in the butt on your way out. I suspect. I never, never heard this from my mother, and of course, I never had the conversation with Red or or Jack. But as my father died when I was a senior in high school, uh, during that football season, when I was recruited. I, I remember vaguely that Jack didn't spend so much time recruiting me. He recruited my mother. And my mother told me I was going to go to Purdue because Mr. Mullenkoff was going to take care of you. And I never knew what that meant. Uh, even after I graduated, I didn't quite appreciate how they extended themselves. Uh, but uh, with age comes a little bit of wisdom and maturity and discovered that uh, I was very, very fortunate, and, and I, and I don't, I'm not suggesting my behavior or my academics warranted that kind of support. Uh, it just I, happened to work out. That it would worked out that way. Right. They, they kept me. Uh, I. Did you have to still continue to dress for the games? No. Oh. Uh, I, I, I did that for a while, uh, but even that, coach said, Prio, you just can't. You just let it go. So I let it go in. That perhaps then set so many things into uh, like dominoes to keep my scholarship. Uh, Red Mackey and Coach Mullenkoff probably spoke with me a half a dozen times, if that. And the only thing they said, Larry, if you're going to keep your to keep your scholarship, you have to remain academically eligible as if you were a football player. So you do have those academic standards. And you have to work 20 hours a week for the athletic department. 
So they assigned me to the co-rec gym. And as a student employee, uh, George Hannaford, the, who, who, I, who I still visit on occasion, George is still alive, George got 20 free hours. He didn't have to pay me out of his <laughs> out of his payroll. Red Mackey paid me. So uh, again, I was not the best of employees, but I was a free 20 hours of student uh, student labor for George Hanford at the Co-Rec, and I had my first exposure to uh, recreational sports and drop-in free play and fitness and those things that later went on to right. shape my career and, and, and my life. So, uh, they worked out. Yes, ma'am. I, I, that's why I said the, probably the worst thing that happened to this skinny kid was to have to give up football right. and perhaps the best thing yeah. uh, at the same time. In, re- in reflection, I, I'm not going to, uh, please understand, I did not have the maturity at the time. I know, we all don't, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, how about, now the career path before you came to Purdue, uh, what were you doing after you, after you graduated and then before you came back to Purdue? Uh, I got my bachelor's uh, in 63 here. Uh, that was followed by a three-year stint in the Army. Uh, the last year of which was spent in Vietnam. Uh, so the, the, the men in my life have been the, those two men and, and every uh, sergeant and officer that kept me alive and I worked with to stay alive while we were in Vietnam. I came back from Vietnam in 66, got a master's degree at Southern Illinois, uh, Carbondale in 67, was fortunate to be offered by George Hannaford an opportunity to come back to the co-rec. Here I was, I had my master's degree, married, uh, one child, or no, child was on the way at the time, I believe, uh, came back to Purdue and worked as an assistant director at the co-rec with George Hannaford from 67 to 70. Uh, in 1970, I left and went to the University of Illinois uh, and worked on my Ph.D. And uh, was fortunate to be able to get in and get out in two years. Yeah. With, by that time, we had two children uh, and uh, left, left Champaign-Urbana with a Ph.D. in 1972 and went to Kent State. Uh, worked at Kent State as director of intramurals, recreational sports, uh, for two years, and uh, then had an opportunity to go to Marquette in Milwaukee. My wife is born and raised in Milwaukee, so this was a a great opportunity for her. (laughs) She also told me, yes, we're going to go to Marquette. Uh, So I, I worked, I was hired by a former Purdue dean of student staffer. He was an assistant dean of students here. Catherine, uh, Jim Scott. Uh, he was vice president for student services at Marquette. Uh, so I had an opportunity, a, a great opportunity to open what was Marquette's version of the Co-Rec Gym. The Purdue's Co-Rec Gym uh, was the first in the country. The first facility dedicated to students, uh, drop-in free play, recreational sports. It wasn't shared by athletics or for physical education. And that was literally the very first in America uh, with such a philosophy and what an That's extensive right. facility is. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it just uh, uh, in America it was, and in, that, in our little culture of rec, rec sports professionals around the world was, was awesome. Uh, Marquette embraced the, uh, the, f- uh, the development of the full student concept uh, it's an inner city campus, and they had very forward-thinking administrators who were looking at the uh, activities, the non-classroom activities of the youngsters, so that they embraced this rec sports concept. And they had a facility under construction. Uh, I had the good fortune in, to be hired in 74. Uh, as they were finishing construction, and then we opened that facility, and it yeah, that's just 
uh, it, it tended to be the, the, the one of the crowns on your career. Uh, Do they have uh, swimming in there as well? Was there a pool? In yes, there? swimming pool, six indoor air-conditioned tennis courts, uh, multi-purpose rooms, racquetball courts. Uh, good, you, it sounds like a good size. Oh, it was. Uh, it was for the size of the campus. It was assignable square feet per student was larger than Purdue's. The facility wasn't larger than Purdue, but they only had 10,000 students at the time, so uh, it was as full service a, a, a multi-purpose facility as one could find for men and women, uh, and it too did not, uh, it was not designed to facilitate athletics. There were no athletic team practices, so the kids weren't thrown out from three to five, that sort of thing. Uh, and Marquette just did it right. And I was uh, fortunate to be there when a, a head basketball coach by the name of uh, Al McGuire was there. And Al won the national uh, men's basketball championship for this little small for Jesuit Marquette? Catholic school to, yeah. to win a national title uh, and to be a, a, a member of the staff not, not obviously the basketball staff or even the athletic staff, but uh, to be on the fringe and to have uh, uh, both Al McGuire and I reported to the same vice president. And Is that the Al McGuire, the commentator? Yes, ma'am. So, he went on to, to have a... Uh, after he left there, and then he went into commentating. Yeah, okay. he went into to be the, the, the voice. Oh, yeah, and, and he, the guy you saw on TV was the same guy he was in person, <laughs> just a... Just a humorous, uh, Al was not what you might say a real rigorous uh, administrator. I mean, Al was a coach and they made him AD and uh, that then uh, gave some of us an opportunity to kind of help Al out and, and that's what our vice president said, Larry, I'd help help Al with the budget here or sure. and, and Al, Larry, do it. If, if they holler, they'll holler at me, don't worry. But that led, uh, Catherine, to my next job. I stayed at Marquette for eight years, uh, and then I was hired at St. Louis University as athletic director. I thought, you know, hey, watching Al do this, this is pretty easy. <laughs> and I got the, to St. Louis University, and I stayed there for two years and discovered that being an athletic director was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. Uh, so uh, I had, after those two years, uh, I, you know, how I wish I could say I had all these things planned out in a career, uh, but a after two years, Catherine, uh, George Hannaford, our, the, the division of exports here at Purdue, was retiring. And one of his Big Ten colleagues, who I knew most of those men, men and women, because I had worked with with them as assistants. Uh, they were having a retirement, uh, Big Ten retirement party for George in Chicago and said, Larry, why don't you come on down? We know you're still close to George. Uh, and we worked out so that it was going to be a surprise and I dressed as a waiter. You know, whatever thing was hokey, we did the hokey thing. But at that retirement was uh, Fishhang, Dr. Fishhang, who was Vice President for Student yes, Services. Yes, he was Vice President for Student Services at the time. All right. And from the time when I was here in the late 60s on Georgia's staff, George used to report, Rec Sports here at Purdue used to report to uh, the athletic director. It was part of athletics. Ergo, when I was, blah, blah, I ended up working at the Co-Rec. George was reporting, uh, reported to uh, Red Mackey for a while, and then uh, George King was athletic director uh, in the uh, at that time, and George Hannaford somehow managed to move. And the university saw the wisdom in moving rec sports from athletics to student services. So uh, Dr. Fishang happened to be in Chicago for George's retirement function chatted with him. Uh, my wife was with me. We, we hit it off wonderfully. Uh, and he suggested, if, would you be interested in applying for this job? And I was, at the time, struggling with being an athletic yeah. director at St. Louis University. Uh, and with luck, uh, 
I was the successful candidate. So after two years uh, at St. Louis, I came to Purdue in back to Purdue in a full right. circle, uh, 1984. So from 84, Catherine, from 84 to 88, uh, I had uh, absolutely the best job in the country. Not only on campus, but Purdue was still at that time, even though there were numerous uh, rec sports facilities ar around the country, the yardstick by which most division of recreational sports were measurement was how do you compare to Purdue and to have that that head job here uh, was great great oh, and, and you know being a Purdue that's why I mentioned being a Purdue undergraduate and have now you asking me to come here and, and give you some oral history that great uh, uh, very fortunate full circle uh, and then uh, let me interject. The yes. field house was the field house was still being used at that time, uh, was it not? In what was the in field what house? time? The field house was because used only, when I was a, a, a right. uh, an undergraduate. Sure. Okay. Uh, in I'm talking 19, from research at Lambert okay. field house. Okay. Nineteen sixty-seven. Uh, they opened the uh, red, or the, they opened the Mackey. So so. 66, perhaps even part of 67, the field house was still being used. But 1967, a uh, young man, a Purdue uh, icon, Rick Mount, was a sophomore then because he couldn't, at the, at, I believe now, you couldn't play varsity as a freshman. So I think he played, he op the first game was Rick Mount, Against Lou L. Cinder of who, USC, of uh, UCLA, UCLA, UCLA. Lou L. Cinder, who was Kareem, who changed his name eventually to be Kareem Abdul Jabbar, uh, and I was again somehow I ended up being the uh, assistant scorekeeper. So I got to sit down on the next to the right next to the field, or next to the, the court down there, and Eddie Eichholz. These are names out of history. Eddie Eichholz was, the, was a physical education instructor and was the tennis coach. Eddie was the official basketball scorekeeper. And they needed by, I, don't, I assume it, Big Ten rules, some rules said they had to have a, an assistant. And uh, he one day almost casually, hey, Larry, would you like to be assistant scorekeeper? Heck, what do I have to do? He said, well, you get into the basketball games free. Oh, sure, I'll do that. So I got to sit down on the, uh, on the sidelines right there to see, some, see Rick Mount's career. Uh, it, it was, so, uh, yeah, that was 67. So they started, they started in Mackey Arena in 1967. But while I was an undergraduate, I remember going to basketball games here at Purdue in the old field house where uh, dirt floor, that, that was the standard, I thought, at the time. It was very cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, in 84, uh, the opportunity to, be, to get involved with the Alumni Association. Yeah, tell us how that came out, then move on to there. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, again, uh, this great career planning <laughs> it was uh, the one of the members of the search committee was Dale Samuels the search committee to replace uh, or to follow Joe Rudolph Joe Rudolph had been uh, executive director of the Purdue Alumni Association for 39 40 maybe even 41 right. years and Joe was 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 an icon uh, they were, they were uh, uh, Dale Samuels was a, a former Alumni Association Associate Director. He was uh, Associate Athletic Director also at one time. In fact, I think he finished his career at Purdue. Um, and the, the little nuances is while I was playing at Purdue early on, he was my 
freshman quarterback coach. And Dale is from Chicago, so there was a bit of an affinity there. Uh, and I, I don't know that he took care of me when I wasn't when I didn't realize it, but he probably had a hand in keeping me in school. Yeah, also, you think about, right. yeah, you think about those things. Uh, he was on the search committee. They were struggling as a search committee on uh, finding candidates, and then the search committee was struggling. Catherine, they were all volunteers. Since the Purdue Alumni Association is independent of the university, they didn't use university faculty and staff to conduct the interviews. These alumni folks from 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 the all of, yeah the right. region to Evansville to Gary to Indianapolis, they'd get together and and try to understand the process and were tried to invent the process. Dale tried to give them as much help as he could, sure. but they weren't, they weren't uh, processing so well. Uh, Dale knew we at the, at the co-rec, we probably re replaced young, because we had a very young staff. It's, it's a profession that attracts young people. We probably uh, replaced two or three young people each year. And I gave uh, seminars to rec sports people around the country, how to be a good interviewer, how to be a good interviewee. They all said, can you come over and talk to these folks? Give them some help. Yeah, give them some help. So I met with uh, half a dozen of them and uh, tried to give them direction on how to, how, you know, what to look for in a candidate, not just that they dressed well, uh, and knew which fork to use during a meal, but w you've got a multi-million dollar administrative structure here, you need to support blah, blah, blah. Uh, about two weeks after I gave them that little mini seminar, uh, Dale visited and said, Larry, would you apply to be the executive director? They really liked I said, Dale, I'm not even a member, even though I'm a graduate, I'm not even a member of the association. <laughs> he said, we, said we, can, we can get that taken care of. Uh, and uh, maybe six months or a few months later, uh, again, I was the successful candidate. Uh, very fortunate. Again, if the co-rec job was the best job in the country for rec sports, uh, I think those last 16 years of my career at the Purdue Alumni Association, yeah, you couldn't beat them. It just, uh, again, it was fortunate to be at the right place, right. Kathleen, at the right time, it works out. And, and it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of your responsibilities and, uh, and the facilities at that time for the researchers? Is in the, was in the Purdue Moral Union, now they have their own building. Yes. Uh, we had a, a office space in the union, um, and at the time, Catherine, the Purdue Alumni Association was uh, the smallest staffed alumni association in the Big Ten. Even though we were third, perhaps, between third and fifth in number of alumni, the, the number Membership of staff, wise. yeah, mem uh, well, Purdue has a member had a, had and I think still does have a membership program. Not all schools have a an alumni membership program. Some some universities you're a member by simply graduating. There is no due structure. Purdue does have a due yeah, structure. I, that's good clarification. Yeah, good and, and Purdue's due structure would not have put us uh, in the top five in the Big Ten. Our number of of alumni that paid dues, we might have been ninth or tenth in the Big Ten. Uh, but our number of living alumni was quite large. Uh, and Purdue's undergraduate uh, enrollment had grown so much since the, in the 70s and 80s, we were, you know, 25, 35, 40,000 students. So more than half of Purdue's alumni uh, had graduated in the last 10 years. So the par part of the responsibilities, this independent board said, Larry, would like you to uh, come in and stabilize the financial picture. 
uh, and grow the membership, the, the dues-paying membership, uh, grow our facilities, uh, and grow the staff. We, we think we're a, a little bit behind the Big Ten in terms of services. Uh, so uh, that was perhaps the, the, the challenge was to one, identify what services we were providing right. alumni, try to identify what the alumni wanted, uh, like, like herding cats, and then to identify around the country what are cutting edge, uh, currently uh, sensitive to alumni organizations, what are they offering? Uh, things from um, employment services, which Purdue had already addressed through their uh, through other uh, avenues on campus, many alumni associations were offering that, and travel, and a, a, a full array of of alumni services. Uh, we began to embrace those yeah, those right. kinds of of right. activities. And, uh, well, a couple of them I was going to sure. one was that ProNet direct search that you put in, and then the credit card program. Yeah, those, the, the, the ProNet, uh, unfortunately, ProNet did not last. Oh, it doesn't um, exist anymore? No. Oh, no. Okay. And, and in fact, uh, Catherine, there are so many iterations of ProNet. Uh, ProNet was one of the first that attempted to capture high-end universities, and Purdue has always been high-end academically, uh, and that is understood by our, our, our colleagues around the country. Uh, when they talk about, uh, let's put together the high-end academic people, it's always Stanford and MIT, uh, and of course the Ivy League, but uh, we, tend, we, te we tend to ignore them because they are, they are so far uh, removed. They're in another. Yeah, that's right. They're almost on another planet. Uh, Purdue and Stanford, and, and, and ProNet came from Stanford, uh, and MIT and Penn State, uh, University of Illinois and Michigan were all a part of ProNet. ProNet... Uh, Unfortunately, I think just died and failed by its own weight. But as it began to falter, the the rising stars and the computer uh, uh, geeks and freaks that were behind ProNet reorganized under a different name with the newer flags and whistles that they learned from. And then eventually, uh, and unfortunately, that effort would fail. Uh, I'm not sure what the current uh, mm -hmm. name is of those efforts. They continue, uh, but with so monster, the, the 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 current college graduate has such so many tools available to them. Uh, I, I suspect the the future of the the pro net folks of the, of the world will not be with the uh, recent graduates, maybe even those that have graduated in the last 10 years, but the upper management, uh, upper mid to uh, lower upper, if there is such terms. I understand, right. Uh, Level. They, they have a networking um, function that uh, could be or may be what one could tap into uh, for a service to our alums that perhaps is a niche that that now is not addressed. It, uh, uh, the, the successful administrator and manager is uh, so fluid to move from the manufacturing business to the electronic business that uh, those, I think history has shown most, most of those networking opportunities are in silos right. and, and now folks are all right, just moving. Uh, I understand. Yeah. So. What about the you did the, the license plates? That was kind of a new thing that you did. Yes, because yes, ma'am. I. How we, did that come about? Uh, IU, God bless them. Uh, the people at IU had a uh, similar. Had, had, oh yes, oh. and in fact, uh, Catherine, now there's hardly a university in the country 
that doesn't have that affinity license plate program. Few are as successful as Purdue and IU, and, and again, God bless them, IU is, has more plates on Indiana cars than Purdue does. Uh, and I'm not sure where IU stole the idea, but uh, my, my closest professional colleague was uh, my colleague at IU. He was a, a wonderful man, very, very innovative, very entrepreneurish, and I, I tended to be more <laughs> structured than entrepreneurial, and so we, we made a great team. Professionally, uh, he would lean on me for some structures issues, and I'd always lean on Jerry for, and, and he first brought that concept to the table. We both went into it uh, at the university at about the same time. Uh, Jerry Tardy at IU, they were smart enough to say, we will administer the program. We will collect the funds. The, the alumni association. Yes, the alumni association at IU. We will collect the funds, market it, and then reassign the funds to appropriate uh, departments on campus, research, scholarships, blah, blah, blah. We do the same thing at Purdue, but PAA, uh, I did not uh, battle the university to say, this is my idea, <laughs> we're going to administer it. Uh, I saw it as a, a great idea for the university, but I didn't have the staff. Not thinking, well, why don't I pay the staff out of the income I'm going to generate? I didn't, I didn't take that approach. And uh, the university, I think is the development office, Chuck Wise at the time. Chuck was vice president for advancement, and they administered the program in the back room. The, the, the front door of it was the Purdue Alumni Association. We you did the marketing. And we all did all the marketing, sure. and, and we were the talking heads. Uh, they would contact the Alumni Association. Yes, ma'am. So we, we did, and, and, and frankly, even the administrative uh, sales and, and processing, it just washed through our office over to Advancement uh, University Development, and they did the plug and chug and then collected the funds and uh, assigned a, an administrative fee to processing each one. And then they assigned, I believe Purdue's almost exclusively scholarships. Uh, and I use certainly preponderance, and again, at the time, uh, the, alum, the Alumni Association assigned the major dollars that came in from this program to scholarships, but the I thought the wisdom of IU was the association processed the money, collected the money, and, and created a little bit of a competitive granting program on campus where chemistry and physics uh, would would uh, say, we sure could use $100,000, and what great friends physics became <laughs> right. of the IU Alumni Association. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I... I believe uh, IU, well, I know when I left in 04, IU was significantly ahead of Purdue in the number of license plates that graduates or supporters uh, put on their vehicles right. as compared to Purdue. Do uh, people from the, uh, anybody on the campus, so it's all anybody university, you can buy the three plates, right? Oh, yeah. So it's open to anybody. Okay. Yeah, and, and one doesn't even need to be a Purdue graduate. Uh, typically, that's who we marketed it. Mar we marketed it to alumni through our club system throughout yeah. the state. Uh, but it could a supporter who's oh not yes. a Purdue alum. Yeah, Absol abs could. Absolutely, they the <laughs> follow the money. If they if they pay their money, we will we'll, we'll get the flight. You betcha. Right. You betcha. Uh, let's move on. Here's the uh, the alumni trustee election for the researchers. Can you clarify that uh, there's three members on the board that are collected by the alumni, is that correct? For yes, ma'am, for, okay. for the board, for the, uh, board, for of the board of trustees. Uh, Catherine, probably the, the, the wisest thing that first Purdue alumni uh, associate, that first 
um, Ross and Aide were involved in there somewhere. They did everything at Purdue at one time. Uh, they concluded and set into motion the fact that the Purdue Alumni Association would be independent of the university. We would not receive any funding. Uh, and at that, in whatever that time is, I'd have to go back and look at the statutes. The state statutes established the fact that at Purdue, three trustees will be and they, the bylaw. Yes, in the in the uh, right. in in the state statutes, the law, and it identifies what schools. At one, the original wording identified one had to be from ag, and and by the way, that's still on the books. One must be an ag graduate, uh, but it talked uh, uh, about the election, and it must be elected by. Uh, at a member of the Purdue Alumni Association, not an alum. Uh, and I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit. Uh, wanted to, to be clear that it is one of the defining moments, I think, in the Purdue Alumni Association's longevity. There are only about, there are only 21 universities that still have in America that still have an independent alumni association. There at one time was probably two and three times that number, but universities eventually saw the wisdom in having the association uh, as an arm of and a part of their administrative structure, and they were, they were given the opportunity to become a part of it. Purdue has not, and I think one of the reasons is this three trustees hired by or elected by uh, the alumni. by the alumni association slash alumni members. So you must be a card carrying member of the alumni association to vote. Uh, for years, Catherine, the chairman and vice chairman of the of the Purdue University Board of Trustees were. Uh, from the uh, that that alumni trio, uh, Bob Jesse and Byron Anderson, just mm -hmm. iconic names here at Purdue. They were those two were both alumni trustees. The current trustees were men or are men that were. Uh, I, I take pride in saying this, even though it probably isn't democratic. Recruited by my office while I was there, and we. Uh, we were able to run but one candidate. I don't know that that is still being done. So it wasn't very democratic. We, we put one candidate on the ballot. There were times that multiple candidates appeared, uh, but the board of directors of the association, long before I became executive director, their history was we will we will vet the candidates and we will slate but one and therefore the alumni voting members would have historically but one choice now they could there's always an opportunity to write in but the board of directors literally hand picked 3 of Hovdes, Beerings, Hansons, Cordova's bosses. And a president would, would be quick to realize, my goodness, the Alumni Association controls one-third of my future, <laughs> of my success. I, I believe, uh, and, and I certainly have never uh, asked Steve Bearing this question, and, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know Steve very well. I never asked him that, uh, but I have to believe that in the back of each president's mind, uh, my goodness, three of the ten, and the tenth is the student member, uh, was chosen by that board of directors slash that executive director. Uh, we best work together. Now, that really meant to me as executive director. Uh, I need to do everything officially and unofficially that I can to uh, help this university be all that it should be. 
the, <laughs> certainly there were times, very seldom, but there were times we didn't quite agree. Uh, I never, ever, ever had to go to our alumni trustees and say, you know, Daddy's beaten up on me. Uh, would, would you help us out? The alumni trustees were always well informed, and, and Catherine, they would come to our uh, annual or our, our three annual board meetings. They would come and sit through our board meetings and come to the board's social functions. Uh, so they knew what we were doing. They sat That's in their trustees. A wise meeting. way to do it. Yes, ma'am. And I, I believe it, it, it was yes. very, very wise. And we save one occasion, maybe two occasions, we did not have an adversarial uh, election process amongst the alumni. There were, there were a couple of times we had uh, trustees that had not been reappointed by the governor and lobbied myself and the board of directors of the Purdue Alumni Association uh, saying, look, here I am. I've had four or eight years of experience sitting on the board. I should be your next alumni trustee. So uh, behind the scenes sometimes, Catherine, there were, <laughs> there were major uh, battles going Discussions, on. Discussions. Discuss yeah, not battles. Thank you. Discussions. Lengthy. Lengthy. Uh, and and some, some became uh, adversarial uh, because the, the board and, and or myself or us in concert concluded that we were quite happy with the performance of our current alumni trustees. The current alumni trustees were interested in continuing. We were interested in continuing our support of them. Uh, and and uh, that was not, not always embraced. <laughs> so you know at, at that level of, of power and that level of... Uh, so it was some of the f uh, finest experiences I had uh, personally as the executive director yeah. and, and also some of the most troubling to see uh, Catherine the, the to be able to say boy I I'm in a position I hope to make a difference and to uh, help the big picture happen and help the trickle trickle down you really get to see right. how things and, and at the same time seeing that sometimes can be most depressing when you see that's why they're fighting and working so hard to have it's not for the university but for their own personal ego Very hard. so those those things uh, sometimes yeah, I wish I have... didn't I wish I didn't see some of those things but 99.9 <laughs> was that, all all winners right you have a, a student board member is there a student board member on the uh, your alumni board do you have a student member? Uh, yes. In oh, fact, okay. there might be an undergraduate. There is an undergraduate, and I, I believe they've now grown the board uh, to have a graduate student voting member. Okay. Uh, but while, while I was executive director, we grew the board from, I think there were 13 or 14 members of the board of directors uh, to just... Uh, under 35. I think we had 33 voting members. Now we may have grown it too big. Yeah, but even at that, that's a good sized board. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good that's a good sized board. Uh, we began to develop uh, committees or task forces of individual representing, for example, uh, all of the schools on campus. We'd have a board of. Uh, or a task force of 11 individuals, each representing the various schools, they in turn would, would elect one individual to sit on our alumni board as the voting member of the alumni board. We probably should have done more consolidation of that uh, while we were growing the board, and we might not have grown it to 33. Uh, but that's that 
great 100% hindsight, <laughs> hindsight but right. we had 33, uh, I think we had 33 voting members, yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay. And uh, one of the changes that you are, the Alumni Association is the official bowl tour operator. Yeah. How did that, but before that, how were the, well, of course there were many we years. We didn't go to a bowl. Yes, Catherine, we did not go to a bowl. So this must have taken place probably when Tiller came or? Yes, oh, okay. when Tiller, uh, I think. But the there were some bowls we went to uh, when um, Herman and uh in the Bart Burrell in, yes. the, in the 80s. Bart, Bart Burrell, yes. And for, and I do not know the history. I do not know the history why uh, or how uh, the athletic department was comfortable with uh, the Alumni Association being the tour operator. Sure. It, it may be uh, historically around the country that was eased. The athletic department were, were most athletic departments uh, they weren't into fundraising. They weren't into friend raising. They weren't into anything other than beating the snot out of the the, athletics. the, the other win games. So it was in those uh, in the eighties, uh, early eighties, late seventies, whenever the that period of time right. when they were going to a few bowls, it may have been simply the easiest thing, and the president of the university endorsed that. It was never an issue for us until Joe Tiller. Uh, so I was here during the... Because there was a big, there was that lapse there yeah, after there that. Yeah, 11, maybe 14 years right. uh, when Coletto and Fred Akers, uh, Leon Burtonett. And Agassiz. Agassiz. Uh, there were a couple of bowl trips for, I think, for Agassiz and, and whoever Leon Burtonett followed. Right. I'm going to call it up. I forget. Uh, Young? Young. Young. Jim and that, Young. Jimmy Young. Um, so then that long gap of 10 or 12 years, part of it was with Joe Rudolph, and then myself sitting in that seat. And then Tiller was hired and looked like we were going to go to a bowl game. And by this time, Purdue's John Purdue Club was beginning to be a bit more active. It wasn't certainly the John Purdue Club that it is today. And advancement, uh, and it was called development at the time right, under yeah. Chuck Wise, they hadn't gotten into the travel business quite like they had. We saw it as a great opportunity to, to really touch alumni, uh, not just in the state of Indiana, but around the country. And, and I got very aggressive uh, in lobbying for that designation, and I wanted to, just to make sure that it was just a continuation of the, the crown had been placed on Joe Rudolph's head and his association. We continued it. Uh, Catherine, we also had a, a normal, I would call a normal alumni travel program uh, at the time of maybe 12 or 15 trips a year. That had been going on. For that had been going on for some time. So it was easy for me to say, hey, we are already the travel people. Uh, and I, I, I went on a high-speed uh, high learning curve from my Big Ten colleagues who had been going to bowl games every year, you know, the Michigans and Ohio States. It was just another day at the office for them to go to a bowl game. But for us it was inventing the wheel uh, and I, I, th I, I think the staff maybe if the staff were here now they'd, they'd say differently but I think the staff enthusiastically embraced this kind of change of pace so that for about a month of our lives it was just terribly uh, frantic but also terribly enjoyable especially for the first three or four years including and the, the Rose Bowl uh, and, and the Rose Bowl was the Cream de la creme. Right. Uh, uh, Catherine, we had uh, 13 chartered aircraft, 11 different hotels in the Los Angeles area, uh, rented over 250 yellow buses, yellow school buses, uh, brought in school bus drivers from Las Vegas because they didn't have enough school bus drivers in Los Angeles to, to handle our size. Uh, it was logistics 
and a logistics experience uh, that, uh, as I reflect on it, makes your head spin. But at the time, you know, you just had to get through each day. You know, we thousands, we moved over 4,000 men and women from all parts of America to get them to those 11 hotels and then to pick them all up and get them to the game. And the parade. And the, and the parade, you, were, were you a part of? No, I did not go, but yeah. I, saw, I know the parade was very early and I know people. Yeah. Ah, 3.30 3 in the morning, we woke them up, gave them a box breakfast at 4, and by 4.15 these buses are going to the parade. Yeah, people shared that with me. <laughs> they were and did, there. And did they, did the, well, I hope to God you didn't run into people who were on the buses driven by the bus drivers from Las Vegas who uh, didn't, were unfamiliar with the territory and didn't speak English. Drive, wonderful drivers. And we had two-way radios and each bus to be able, not thinking we'd have drivers who couldn't speak English. So when they got lost, they'd call in to headquarters. And we had, we couldn't understand what was going on. We couldn't communicate with them. Uh, so we, we, we lost a number of buses that parked in places like a, at, at 4.35 a.m. would park in uh, fast food restaurant parking lots, hoping that another yellow bus would pass and they'd follow it. <laughs> Somehow we got everybody to the game, and uh, th those are, are uh, great experiences, uh, great income generators for the Alumni Association. Uh, many of the Bulls, Catherine, were losers, financial losers, because we didn't have enough right. folks, especially after five or six years, uh, Purdue would be going back once again to El Paso and going back once again to Detroit. In that, that the first four or five years, everybody was excited because they hadn't been to a bowl in 15 or 20 years. But even, even the bowl games began to, to wear off. And you, you may often read or hear people say, Joe Tiller now is uh, a victim of his own success. And, and we were also. That was an example that, you know, hey, we don't want to go to El Paso. We want to go to Florida. God, <laughs> you ought to be tickled just to, but people are fickle. Yeah. Um, tell us a little about the Dick and Sandy Doss. You were involved a little bit with the uh, selection and uh, on the well, construction and whatever. Y yes, ma'am. Uh, at one point in time, the the building, as you, you might, as you see the Dick and Sandy Dauk uh, Alumni Center, you note that there's a big box at one at one end of the, the facility, big square box, and it houses advancement, all of the advancement personnel, or 95 percent of the advancement personnel, and then there's this beautiful atrium that connects. Uh, then a, a rather small two-story little building f that the alumni staff are in. Uh, the advancement building was on the books and was on, uh, on the construction schedule. And as that construction schedule was nearing its initiation, Dr. Jiski uh, approached me, and by the way, at the time, and I, I, it may still be going, I was on Dr. Beering's uh, cabinet and I was on Dr. Jiski's cabinet. Uh, and in passing one day, uh, Dr. Jiski said, Larry, please stick around. Uh, and, and he pitched, hey, why don't we bring you guys out of the union put you in here, we'll call the full facility uh, the Alumni Center, even though 80% uh, of the occupants will be advancement folks. We don't need to call this the fundraising building of America. That And those were never his, his words, and we talked but, very, right. but, but that was the bottom line. You're going to, you have an opportunity. Uh, the, the numbers are right. Uh, 
the site is right, it uh, would like your help in uh, pitching this concept to your board. We, in fact, talked to the leadership of the board, and the leadership uh, took a while to uh, conclude that this would be the best thing for the Alumni Association. We were looking at the time, Catherine, for expansion and construction north, uh, closer to athletic facilities or in the, in the, the more populated student section of this campus rather than south. Uh, but the, the wisdom of, of space and, and dollars really worked to, to assist us. The board of directors concluded this is what we would do and advancement. Part of the deal was uh, Chuck Wise. Uh, no, I think it was, it might have been Murray by that time. Mm -hmm. Yes, Murray, absolutely. Murray said we will assign people to help you guys raise the funds for your part of the facility because the funding had already been approved for advancement. So we had to raise $4 million, uh, and I would say, Catherine, that we, we had to simply sign a couple of letters that they mass produced. They were the fundraisers. They knew how to do it. Again, it's kind of like the, the, the license plate program. We did the, some of the talking head stuff, but they really did a great job, raised the $4 million. Uh, Dick Dauk was a former football player, and I knew him as an undergraduate. Uh, I'd like to take credit for being the, the end of, I had nothing to do with identifying Dick or pitching him. When he had agreed, then I became a kind of a, a front man yeah, with it, yeah, but yeah. Uh, and they, they've been there ever since. Yeah. So, Yes, we, we often talk about the Alumni Association being actively involved in the, in the concept and the design and the uh, fundraising and construction. The construction end, yes ma'am, I, I probably visited that construction site at least four days a week. Uh, I, I, th I think I understood construction from my years at, the Rex, at Rex Sports and helping build uh, facilities around the country. So I really enjoyed the construction end uh, and advancement. The advancement office and the alumni office was very collaborative in the design. But we really need to know the design, that, that, one, <laughs> that one square building, that was there. And so we tried to schmooze it up here by the, this very attractive part to, to take care of us. Yeah. So, but the fact that it's south of campus was very controversial for the folks in the Sanctum Sanctorum, you know, the inner circle people. Why would we go to the south part of campus when we should be closer to the stadium, closer to the residence halls, less like the, like the Black Cultural Center every day so many youngsters pass that. And the, the fact that students really need to be engaged as undergraduates to appreciate their association later on, um, we might have missed the boat there. Might have. I don't know. Don't out. know. Yeah. yeah. Things work out. Yes. Right. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to. Yep. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, this will end it for the time being.